Okay, welcome back for part four. My food is not ready yet, so we're gonna continue with the video. I hurt my toe for some reason. I know, you were just wondering. I hope Chris didn't hurt his toe. I did. I don't know when it did, but I did. All right, before we get started, this was a donated request from Yasin Muhammad. And you can also donate to the channel through the thanks button. It's not required. It is appreciated. It just supports the channel, but you don't have to. You can still request videos. It just takes a little bit longer to get to. I'm a little backlogged right now with uh, requests and donate requests. If you don't want to do that, you can subscribe to the channel. And if you don't want to do that, just give a thumbs up. Most of the people who watch my videos aren't subscribed anyway, so it's kind of weird. Most of the people who watch them aren't subscribed. The people who are subscribed don't watch them. <laughs> eh, you know, it all works out in the end. So, on to the video. I picked them both up, I put them on my animal, and we rode back to Medina. Yeah, we went back about five seconds. Now is when the ass, the, the ass, did I just say the ass? I meant to say previous, but apparently the preview part went missing so this is when the last that's what it was it was lat yep I gotta relearn the whole English language apparently so the ass video uh, number three this is where the ass video started I'm just gonna shut my mouth so he comes back to Medina the brave Al Walid ibn Al Walid the brother of Khalid, may Allah be pleased with them, subhanAllah. Uh, he said, you know, he, he rode back into Medina on this brave mission with Hisham ibn As and Ayas ibn Rabi'a. And he said, subhanAllah, that when I did that, like the mission, he said, like, I, I basically broke one of my fingers and it was like flowing with blood. And he looked at his finger and said, هل, هل أنت إلا أسبوع دميت وفي سبيل الله ما لقيا? Are you, aren't you just but a finger that bleeds and you found what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you? You're, you're, you're seeking, it's only in the path of Allah, like it's okay. I'm glad to have lost a finger, fi sabirillah, in doing this mission. And he brought back Hisham ibn As and Ayash ibn Rabi'a to Al Madina, Al Munawwara with the Prophet. Hence, Hisham ibn As becomes one of Ashab al Hijratain, one of the people who made the two Hijras. He made the Hijra to Abyssinia. And he made the hijrah to Medina, even though it was torture. And subhanAllah, he suffered so much up to this moment and was so happy to be in the company of the Prophet in Medina. And again, missing Badr, missing Uhud, missing Khandaq. Like there's a history that you have to accustom yourself to now in Medina. And it just so happened that at the same time that this happens, the, uh, similar to that time, that is when the Muslims came on the ship now, now that I think about it, it's pretty funny because the Muslims that came on a ship, crossed on a ship through the Red Sea, uh, obviously, the Yemenis went to Abyssinia and they joined the Sahaba there and they came on a ship uh, provided by a Najashi uh, towards the Muslims. Alhamdulillah, no one interrupted uh, those ships uh, and they, they arrived at Medina. So people are arriving at Medina all at the same time, right? They're all arriving at the same time. And so he's arriving around that context. And then he says, eventually, obviously, my brother Amr became Muslim. And Amr ibn As anhu, joins Islam very close before uh, Fatih Mecca. Very few narrations uh, from him in this regard about his time with the Prophet wasallam. There's a narration that they both narrate. An ibn al-As, it's in Muslim Imam Ahmad. So on behalf of the two sons of al-As. قالوا ما جلسنا مجلسا في عهد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كنا به أشد اختباطا من مجلس جلسنا يوما. So there was no gathering that we sat with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that we felt better about, that we, that we feel we, you know that we felt good about than this particular مجلس, this particular city. He said جئنا والناس عند حجرة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يتراجعون في القرآن. We came and there was a group of people. That were sitting outside of the house of the Prophet وسلم, and they were debating. The, the, the context of the hadith is that يتراجعون في القرآن, they were actually like debating on certain verses and what they meant, doing like tafsir, ta'wil at that time, right? They're 
interpreting it in certain ways, and they're basically young people having a discussion about the Qur'an. But he says, فَلَمَّا رَأَيْنَاهُمْ اَعْتَزَلْنَاهُمْ When we saw them, we were like, this doesn't look like the type of gathering that the Prophet ﷺ would be pleased with. You're supposed to be sitting and reflecting, but the way they're debating, the way that they're, they're showing their differences of opinion, we don't think it's a good one. So he says, when we did that, Rasulullah ﷺ خَرَجَ عَلَيْنَا مُغْضَبًا يُعْرَفُ الْغَضَبُ فِي وَجْهِهِ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ Prophet ﷺ came out and you could see the anger in his face and the Prophet ﷺ said to those people, أَيْ قَوْمْ بِهَذَا أُهْلِكَةَ الْأُمَمُ قَبْلَكُمْ بِإِخْتِلَافِهِمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ O oh my people, this is how the Ummah, the nations before you went astray because of their disagreements and because of the way that they would, they would, they would uh, you know, respond to their Prophets. وَضَرْبِهِمُ الْكِتَابِ بَعْضَهُ بِبَعْضٍ And then they're comparing verses to verses of the book, right? So the way they started to use verses against verses. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, basically when he did that, he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَمَا عَرَفْتُمْ مِنْهُ فَاعْمَلُوا بِهِ وَمَا تَشَابَهَ عَلَيْكُمْ فَآمِنُوا بِهِ Beautiful hadith by the way, the Prophet ﷺ said, so whatever you know of the verses, whatever you understand of the Qur'an, act in accordance with it, and whatever you can't understand, then believe in it. آمِنُوا بِهِ So he says, ثُمَّ الْتَفَتَ إِلَيَّ وَإِلَىٰ أَخِي The Prophet ﷺ looked at me and Amr approvingly. So me and Amr were so happy. We were like, Alhamdulillah, <laughs> we escaped you know, the anger of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ looked at us as the only two people that understood that that's not what the Qur'an was sent for. He said that was the happiest day that we had with the Prophet ﷺ, that we escaped his displeasure in that moment. There's another very interesting uh, hadith, which is Sunnah Abi Dawood, and it's an authentic hadith. Um, and it shows you sort of the complexities of the people of Mecca, right? Like Al-As, as terrible as he was, for whatever reason, he had in his will, and of course it's easy to, to put things in your will, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ forbade people you know, from trying to will away everything at the time of their death and then deprive their own sons, uh, their, own, their own children. Here, uh, Al-As had in his will to emancipate a hundred slaves with his wealth. Very interesting. Al-As who is Al-As and the nasty person that he was and the way he treated the poor in his own lifetime. But he had in his will to emancipate a hundred uh, slaves. So Hisham, with everything his father did to him and with everything that he went through, Hisham uh, actually on his behalf emancipated 50 people, 50 slaves. And then he went to Amr ibn As to his brother and said, you should emancipate 50 as well. And Amr ibn As was a little confused about the situation, like what's it going to benefit Al-As anyway, right? So it's one thing that we free slaves, which is good in Islam, but is it for our father or is it uh, for something else? And this is where the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّهُ لَوْ كَانَ مُسْلِمًا فَأَعْتَقْتُمْ عَنْهُ أَوْ تَصَدَّقْتُمْ عَنْهُ أَوْ حَجَجْتُمْ عَنْهُ بَلَغَهُ ذَلِكْ The Prophet ﷺ said, if he was a believer, then you're freeing slaves on his behalf, you're sacrificing on his behalf, your donations on his behalf, your hajj on his behalf would have reached him. But otherwise, you do this to and you do this on your own, but it's not for him at this point, right? Al-As is done. But it shows you kind of the way that Al-Hisham, uh, uh, Hisham al as was. So what happens and what becomes of Al-Hisham al as Hisham al as goes on to basically serve under his brother in the Muslim army. So Amr ibn As becomes one of the, the most key generals in Islam. And he's leading these armies across Asham under Abu Bakr and Umar, uh, continues to do so with Egypt, which is obviously his biggest accomplishment, which we'll talk about inshallah ta'ala. So Hisham serves under his brother, who was serving under Khalid bin Walid. SubhanAllah, the way that it all turns. His two persecutors are now his two commanders in battle. And Hisham is someone who is incredibly brave. So the last two mentions we have of him, subhanAllah, actually tie into the last two battles of Khalid and Murid that we were talking about last week. The first one was Ajnadin, which was in Palestine. And we said that Ajnadin is, uh, was in Wadi Sunt, which, the Valley of Sunt, which some of the scholars say is where David defeated Goliath. And the Muslims had about 30,000 uh, troops against 90,000 Romans and this is the first real battle between the Muslims and the Romans like a big battle between the Muslims and the Romans and what is said about Hisham in this battle 
is that there was a time when the Muslims got exhausted in this battle. It was a heavy battle between the Muslims and the Romans. And Hisham took off his helmet. And he turned around and he addressed the Muslims. And he said, Ya ma'ashar al-Muslimin, inna ha'ula al-Rum la yasbirun ala al-Sayf. He said, O oh, Muslims, these people, these Romans, la yasbirun ala al-Sayf. They're not, they're not patient with the sword. Just keep on going, keep on fighting. And then he plunges into the battle and he starts, I mean, taking out warrior after warrior. And he's calling out, Ya ma'ashar al-Muslimin, isna'u ma sana'atu. O oh, Muslims, come and do what I'm doing. And then he said famous words that became attributed to him. He said, Ya ma'ashar al-Muslimin, amin al-jannati tafirrun. Ya ma'ashar al-Muslimin, amin al-jannati tafirrun. So he starts shouting out to them, O oh, Muslims, are you running away from Jannah? Are you fleeing away from Jannah? Amin al-jannati tafirrun. Are you running away from Jannah right now? Come forward the way that I'm going forward. And when he did that, a large group of the troops kind of got re-energized. And some of the books of history say that was actually a turning point. Like there are moments in the battle where you get weak. That was that turning point that eventually led to victory. How often are you going to hear the name of Hisham, the brother of Amr, having anything to do with the victory of Ajnadin? Khalid radiallahu anhu always gets the credit, as he should, for devising the plan. But it's those brave soldiers in the middle of it, right? And he is that person. Then comes the Battle of Yarmouk, which is his final battle. In the Battle of Yarmouk, which was obviously uh, in, in, in Syria and Asham, and it was the most famous battle of Khalid radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Khalid led, um, Hisham ibn As plunges forward and he fights bravely. And he was protecting a large group of his own cavalry. And, and he, uh, he's martyred in that battle. So he's actually a shaheed in Yarmouk. And subhanAllah, there's a story there that as he was a shaheed in the way things are processing, where his body fell, the way that the pace of the battle is going and the way that his body is placed, if the Muslims were to get down from their horses in battle and try to pick up his body, then it was actually going to compromise the battle. But they saw Hisham and they know he's a noble sahabi of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's a noble man. And it was Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was looking at his brother and he said, his soul is already in Jannah. His body doesn't mean anything right now. Go. Keep fighting. Like, like you think about Ahl Ghazza, the bodies. That's not what it's about. It's about the soul. I, I understand what he's saying, but you, you feel like you're tarnishing the person, even though it's just the body. You feel like you're tarnishing that person by letting them get stepped on by horses or, you know, whatever. And you you want to preserve that body. <clears throat> there was a... Um, it was a movie. I, I'm going to say it was like The Last Executioner of England or something like that. And it's a, it's a really good movie based on true story about this uh, guy who was... Um, I think it was... It was in the 1900s, maybe. He um, was an executioner in England. His job was to figure out the weight of the person um, and the noose and everything like that. And he would pull the lever and it would it would hang him. Or hanged him, however you're supposed to say it. I don't know. And... He did hundreds, I think. Could have been... Yeah, he did hundreds, I want to say. But anyways, there's a really... I find it very touching where it's his criminal. And uh, I don't remember if the guy was a, a pedophile or what. I don't remember. But he pulls the lever and executes the guy takes down the body <laughs> strips him naked and then um, begins to do the process of washing the body and he wasn't a Muslim but he's washing the body and he's, he's treating the body now uh, with respect to be buried and there was somebody who comes in 
and they see him doing this and they said why are you doing that you know that guy's a scumbag and he don't quote me on this but he makes a comment to the guy the man's soul is paying the price the body is a shell that we should respect and so even though he might have hated this person for what they did they're, they, they will be punished but why punish the body the body didn't do anything wrong it's a shell it's just a shell for the soul and I found like, like that was really touching that he w would respect the body that much when you know let's let's be honest if Adolf Hitler's in front of me yeah I'm probably lighting his body on fire if he was dead like I, I you know some people I think we can all agree we would not treat with respect the body afterwards but it, it was very it was just very respectful the way he did it but I understand why they're wanting to rescue the body but it's true you know the person's gone what you know about that person their their interaction everything like that's gone let's just deal with the battle now they can't help us let's just focus on the battle you know what i mean i get that it's about the soul so what is it about the body it's about the soul so keep on going keep on going keep on going don't worry about the body he would want you to keep on going and so they continued forward, and his body was actually in multiple pieces. SubhanAllah. And Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, after the battle concluded, and Yarmulk Allah Azza gave them victory, Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu went around the battlefield and he had to collect the parts of his brother to bury it in one grave. He was so emotional. His only brother, the brother that preceded him in Islam. And when the news reached Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, remember, he was supposed to be the companion of Umar in the Hijrah. Umar radiallahu anhu said, Rahimallah, akhi Hisham, may Allah have mercy on my brother Hisham, fa ni'ma awnan kana lil Islam. What a great supporter he was to Islam. What an incredible supporter he was to Islam. And here's the story that makes the title of this lecture make sense before we talk about Amr ibn As. Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, years later, is making tawaf around the Kaaba. And there's a group of young tabi'een, young second generation Muslims, that are sitting around talking, like, that's Amr ibn As, right? That's Amr ibn As. And that's, you, you see a lot of these narrations, especially in Hajj, where you got these young people that are from the next generation, like, Dude, that's Abdullah ibn Umar, that's Abdullah ibn Masood, that's Amr ibn As. Like, these are the celebrities of the next generation. So Amr is making tawaf and he hears these young people in the halaqa and they're talking about him. That's Amr al As, that's Amr al As, that's Amr al As. And they're having a conversation amongst themselves. So Amr al As finishes radiallahu ta'ala anhu his tawaf. And then he goes and he sits amongst them. Sufyan ibn Uyayna is the narrator of this narration. He goes and he sits with them. And he says to them, uh, Oh young people, I, what were you talking about? And so, they were kind of shy a bit to say exactly what they were talking about. And he said, I think I have an idea what you were talking about, but it's better if it comes from you. What were you talking about? So they said to him that we were talking amongst ourselves and we said amongst ourselves, is Amr ibn As better or Hisham ibn As? <laughs> That's the conversation we were having. We're trying to figure out, we're basically having a debate amongst ourselves, man afdal, who's better, Amr ibn As, the famous Amr ibn As, or his lesser known brother, who became Muslim before him and who did all this before him. Who's better, Amr or Hisham? Anta khayr am akhuk, Hisham. Who's better, you or Hisham? So Amr ibn As puts his head down. And he starts to tell this story. And he says, SubhanAllah, I mean, it's, it's hard to think about this outside of Gaza right now. <clears throat> but he says that the day before Yarmouk, he said, me and my brother were making dua together. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us as shuhada. So he says, Aradna anfusana ala Allah. We presented ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Faqabilahu wa tarakani. 
Allah accepted him as a shaheed and he left me behind. So he's better than me. SubhanAllah. He's better than me because Allah accepted him as a shaheed and Allah did not yet accept me as a shaheed. And Amr was so emotional thinking about this brother and the moments of making dua. من المؤمنين رجال صبقوا ما عاهد الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبا ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا. These are the sincere believers, your brothers and sisters, who were truthful to the covenant with the covenant they made with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And Hisham ibn al As was not seeking the glory of this world. He wasn't seeking to be mentioned in halakas. He wasn't seeking to have his name in the history books. He was seeking his name with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And Allah Azza wa Jal accepted him as a shaheed as someone who did the hijrah twice, as someone who's from the sabiqun al-awwalun, the muhajirun, uh, the people who, who were tortured in Islam, tortured for a decade almost in Islam, a person who went out in battle, strove for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and died as a shaheed, even before his brother in one of the most uh, consequential battles in the history of Islam. فَرَضِي اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ وَعَنْ أَخِي May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him and be pleased with him and his brother Amr bin As. So next week, inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about Amr bin Haas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, inshallah ta'ala. And now you can have the background of who his father was and who his, his notable brother uh, was. May Allah have mercy on him. Jazakumullah khayran. Sallallahu wa sallam baraka nabira Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay. Yeah, that's got to be a, a tough question. Who's, who's more important? I would have probably, like if I'm in that situation, I would have said my brother, because my brother sacrificed. He, he, he gave himself for the ultimate sacrifice. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to end this here. Um, that was good. But I got to... I gotta go get some food. So, hope you enjoyed. I did. And until next time, have a good day, have a good night.